Recently, I met the greatest athlete ever. I know this because he told me he was. He also the, has the greatest business acumen of anyone in the world. I know this because he told me he does. He's also the greatest corporate coach for all the top CEOs in the world. And I know this because he told me so. So I recently listened to a guy who is a motivational speaker. That's what he does. And he really was compelling, easy to listen to. His stories had peaks and valleys, great communicator, dynamic personality. He travels across the country encouraging and raising money for homeless veterans. And honestly, the work he's doing, it's really good. But I just need to say, he opened his remarks with a more than five minute video montage of spliced clips of newscasters interviewing him from around the country. And one clip after another, you hear the newscasters praising how great he was. You're so great. You really are great. You're just the greatest. It was absolutely over the top. Now you could interpret me sounding jealous here, but I, I don't think I am. I think my ego is strong enough to coexist with this man's understanding of himself. I'm just pointing out that his ego takes up a lot of space in the room. This guy's done some cool stuff for homeless veterans and even children of veterans, but he might be the most conceited philanthropist that I've ever listened to. Now, I know I'm being cheeky with this, and I probably owe this guy an apology letter, but honestly, his video montage is something to behold. I can't get it out of my mind because it captures so much of what I see in the disciples in Luke 22. Look at verse 24. A dispute also arose among them, the disciples, as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So they're arguing among themselves as to who is the greatest. I mean, really? And when you put this into context in the story, it makes this moment for the disciples even worse. I mean, Luke has this unbelievable moment unfolding. And it is right after what we talked about last week with the Last Supper. Last week, we stepped into one of, if not the most important meal scenes in all of the Bible. The Last Supper is where Jesus announces his intentions to suffer unto death for all of humanity. It's the archetypal moment that Christians have celebrated every day ever since. Jesus announces he's giving his body and blood unto death for us willingly. It's the greatest sacrificial act humanity has ever known. And the disciples are arguing about who among themselves is even greater. Wow. I mean, Jesus just told them that his body is like bread, taken, blessed, and broken in order to be given, which shows us that in his brokenness we are healed, made whole, and his blood is poured out like wine, reauthoring for us a theological understanding of blood. Now, I think we sometimes forget this detail, but in ancient Jewish culture, if you touched blood, it made you ceremonially unclean in every way. You would have to atone for it. You would have to go to the temple and allow a priest to help you become ritually cleansed. Yet here's Jesus reauthoring the power and cleansing nature of blood. It's going to be poured out of him like a balm, telling us he's the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate priest. Now that's amazing. This moment could not have been greater. And the disciples are literally in the room arguing amongst themselves. This scene in Luke 22 is phenomenally great. Jesus declares the brokenness of his body will lead to wholeness. His blood cleanses that which is unclean. I mean, incredible. And the disciples miss it. I mean, hear verse 24 again. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So let's really see this. Jesus has declared the brokenness of his body will lead to wholeness. His blood cleanses that which is unclean. And the disciples are disputing amongst themselves which one will be regarded as even greater. It's like their egos couldn't hold the sanctity of the moment 
so they then make the moment about themselves. They're given VIP passes to the greatest meal scene in the Bible, and they dispute how great they are. Think about that. This is all ego. They can't see beyond their own self-absorption. They have to dispute with one another. And there's a little nugget here with the Greek word for dispute. It means the love of strife. The disciples aren't just disagreeing, they're thriving on their disputes. They're generating strife among themselves and they are loving it. And you know people like this. These are the people who can fight you on just about anything. I played baseball with a guy who had this spiritual gift. You could get a hit up the middle and the first thing he would say to you is, the second baseman stumbled, if he didn't, he would have made that play. And your response is like, dude, we are on the same team. Why do you need to make something out of nothing? I mean, this guy thrived on strife. He had to tear things down to make himself feel big enough. This is the same guy that would talk up his skill. He strutted around reminding everyone on the team how great of a hitter he was. It was almost like he was trying to convince himself. And all of us knew he was hitting sub 200 against lefties. At some point, you have to stop telling people how great you are and actually go out there and show us. Your stats don't lie. Regardless, this guy was a lover of strife. Unhealthy partners do this in marriages all the time. Your partner doesn't quite load the dishwasher like you would, and you say what you know you shouldn't say, because, and you say it anyway. Sometimes marital partners thrive on strife. I'm convinced we do this because deep down we feel inadequate and insecure about who we are and the space that we take up. So we make those around us feel smaller. So at least for that moment, it feels like we're a little bigger. This is what the disciples are doing. They miss the enormity of the Last Supper due to strife. And here's Jesus' response in verse 25. But he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. Now this is true. There's an enormous caste system in the first century. I mean, kings are great. The people are not. Gentile kings are called benefactors because they bestow benefits onto people as if they care. But really, they were taxing the same group and benefiting profitably from them. Anyway, Jesus continues, verse 26. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. You must become like a child, the one who has no birthright, who's the lowest in the caste. You must become like the servant the one who serves. Jesus is reauthorizing and reauthoring greatness here. It's not kings or dignitaries, those who claim power. Greatness is found in those who serve, especially those who serve the underserved. Look what Jesus says next in verse 27. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves. This is a complete role reversal of the status quo. The greatest among you are supposed to get the seats of honor. And Jesus is saying, by the way, I am the greatest, but I'm choosing to take the lowest place of honor. In other words, the greatest among us will be those who serve. When I was 16, I worked at the Grand Ole Opry. It was a cool gig. My first summer job in which taxes were taken out of my paycheck. My job title was a plaza host, which meant I had to do whatever was needed behind the scenes. Most of the time I would work a cash register, but other times I would stock or take inventory. One day I got to stand at a doorway and tell guests that they were not allowed to walk through. Pretty boring. I had a shot, though, of the loading dock behind the stage. There was a memorial service for an old country star that had just passed away, and several A-listers were arriving and unloading. Garth Brooks's tour bus 
showed up while I was standing watch, and they unpacked that bus at breakneck speed. In the middle of all the activity, there was Garth, moving boxes, laughing, listening to his crew tell stories, chiming in as needed, working and sweating just as hard as everyone else. When you see the greatest in the room serving alongside those hired to serve, it really changes everything. It repositions the system of power. It puts the totality of privilege in the act of service. And when you see someone great serving, you can't unsee it. And that's what Jesus is doing in the Last Supper. In the Gospel of John, in John 13, this is the moment he then washes his disciples' feet, doubling down on this serve-first role reversal. Jesus is flipping the paradigm here on what it means to be great. If you want to be great, then serve first. Give of yourself and your talents to people in need around you. It's not about the power or the prestige that you hold. It's how you share it and give of yourself to serve those around you. And Paul agrees with this when he writes in the letter to the Philippians, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There is no greater act of service than laying down your life. You only lay down your life when you're able to humble yourself. You can only humble yourself when you no longer feel the need to self-absorb. You break the cycle of self-absorption when you regard others as better than yourselves. You regard others as better than yourselves when you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. You look to the interests of others when you let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. John 13 and Philippians 2 really help us understand Luke 22 better. It's not complicated. Jesus takes our egocentric view and shows the disciples that they must integrate into a world-centric view, a view that doesn't lord over the little, a view that doesn't set apart the proud, a view that humbles itself for the sake of others. As Jesus says, the greatest among us must become like the youngest and the leader like the one who serves. And this is still true for us. I mean, do you really want to be great? I mean, if you do, then give of yourself to the kingdom of God. Pour yourself out into a life of service. And you can do that with us here at First Baptist. We can help. We have volunteer opportunities. We have mission partners and a clothing closet that needs to be restocked. We have meal ministries and visitation ministries that you can give of yourself to. You can join groups and give money and support our efforts to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's how you can be great. That's how the world will know you're great. That's how Jesus reauthors for all of us that those who serve are the greatest.